as people join. Um, thank you everyone for joining me today as I'm here to discuss psilocybin in psychiatry, existing research and future direction. I wanna take a moment up front to reflect on why this topic matters. Uh, currently a third to a half of people are refractory to first line depression treatments and success rates for treatment resistant depression are low. Suicide rates are high and have been increasing. Therefore, there is a growing interest in novel therapies for treatment of depression, such as psilocybin. Learning objectives are listed here. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll quickly move on and I'll try and save some time for questions at the end. Um, so, psilocybe is a genus of mushrooms with over 100 different species within it most of which of those species do contain psychedelic compounds such as psilocybin, psilocin, baocystin, and norbaocystin. They look like little brown mushrooms. On the bottom left, we see a dried mushroom a photo of psilocybe cubensis. Uh, in the middle there, we see two figures, one dried, one living of psilocybe mexicana, another living variant of a psychoactive uh, psilocybe mushroom is shown in the bottom right there. Different psychedelic mushroom species are found throughout the world on every continent besides Antarctica, as we can see here represented by those little black mushroom dots. Each one of those is a species. So there is a lot of fascinating history uh, surrounding psilocybin and ancient cultures. However, history will not be the focus of today's discussion. But we do know that psilocybin has been used in spiritual and religious ceremonies in various cultures for at least 5,000 years, with ample evidence of use in multiple Mesoamerican societies. Aztecs referred to psilocybin as flesh of the gods. It wasn't until 1955 when Valentina and R. Gordon Wasson became the first known modern Westerners to actively participate in a guided uh, mushroom ceremony in Mexico. And in 1958, Albert Hoffman, the discoverer of LSD, isolated and named psilocybin. He also developed a synthetic psilocybin that he marketed for, a, a, that was on the market for a few years. Psilocybin was categorized as Schedule One in the USA in 1970, and this uh, shut down any research on it really until about the year 2000. I do want to start uh, the discussion today by, by talking about how, how psilocybin exerts its effects. So psilocybin, the top left figure, not sure if you can see my mouse cursor here, there's its molecular structure and psilocybin is rapidly converted to psilocin via alkaline phosphatase and a nonspecific esterase enzyme. So the psilocin is the active metabolite of psilocybin. And notice how uh, the molecular structure of psilocin is remarkably sim similar to that of serotonin or 5-hydroxytryptamine. And um, of note, psilocin is also remarkably similar in molecular structure to the psychedelic DMT um, or dimethyltryptamine, which is the same as psilocin, just missing that OH or hydroxyl group. So um, psilocin acts as a partial agonist on the 5-HT2A receptors, also 5-HT1, 5-H2C receptors predominantly, maybe some other receptors as well. And this partial agonism of the 5-HT2A receptor, the serotonin 2A receptor, is thought to be necessary for its subjective effects as blocking that receptor with a highly selective antagonist ketanserin blocks the subjective effects, both of LSD and of psilocybin. And as the colored ribbons diagram show here, these are colored ribbon diagrams of the serotonin 2A receptor binding to different ligands. And we see that um, each ligand binds slightly differently to the receptor. And that leads to both um, variations in signaling strength and, and characteristics of the cell signaling. And if we look down at figure F, we can see in the bottom right, we can see an illustration of this um, as this, this assay is demonstrating uh, 5-HT2A cell signaling. And we can see that uh, psilocin has less uh, signaling than endogenous serotonin or LSD does, for example. And so the partial agonism nature of psilocin 
explains why serotonin syndrome is rare with this compound, even in even if taken in combination with with SSRIs. Excuse me. Okay, so not only does the intensity of the signaling change with different agonists, like I just mentioned, but the downstream pathways are not stimulated equally. So with the biased agonism of psilocin, we see a different signaling pattern compared to endogenous serotonin, for example. And, and there are also examples of 5-HT2A uh, re receptor agonists that do not have psychedelic properties, such as ergotamine, for example. And so um, the bias property, this I thought this was interesting that the bias agonism property of psilocin and, and these psychedelic 5-HT2A um, agonists or partial agonists, it's hypothesized to be in part secondary to this, um, the 5-HT2A receptors forming this hetero complex with dopamine 2 receptors as illustrated in the figure there. And so as an interesting aside, they, um, there's this hypothesis that, you know, block the atypical antipsychotic drugs that block the 5-H2TA receptor, as well as other serotonin receptors and block D2 receptor somewhat at higher doses, they may have, um, you know, this may explain some of their antipsychotic actions as they don't just block those two receptors, but they also block the allosteric enhancement of D2 receptor signaling by 5-H2A uh, promoter activation. Thought that was interesting. Other, other results of the signaling cascades, which is, this is very simplified and it's complex, but one of the downstream effects is brain-derived neurotrophic factor or BDNF levels increase, which is known to increase brain plasticity. And then one of the most important downstream effects of the 5-HT2A partial agonism from psilocybin is the depolarization of cortical layer five pyramidal neurons um, that are distributed unevenly throughout the entire cortex. So that's the Cliff Notes version of what is happening at the molecular level. Um, but how is psilocybin exerting these effects on a brain network level? So in order to attempt to answer that, I need to first mention uh, the default mode network or DMN. Regions of the default mode network are highlighted in color in this figure. Key regions include the PCC or the posterior cingulate cortex and precuneus here. Also the uh, ventromedial prefrontal cortex and the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex, as well as other regions. So the the default mode uh, the default no, mode network is thought to be involved in a number acti of activities, and it's at the and it has this baseline balanced activation during rest. It's it uses the most amount of um, blood as compared to other regions of the brain, and it's thought to be involved in mind wandering and autobiographical memory, planning ahead, thinking about the future. And self-referential thinking, I've highlighted self-referential thinking in, in bold here because it's been hypothesized that the default mode network does play a role in thinking about oneself, forming a sense of oneself, and really uh, playing a role in the formation of the ego. Um, and it's not just involved in thinking about ourselves, it's also thinking about other people's beliefs, intentions, and motivations. And it may have some, some role in, in down-regulating or modulating emotions, feelings, and desires. And so the, the figure on the right um, is illustrating that activity in the default mode network, it's modulated by incoming external information, which is the top arrow there. And that's actively accumulated and integrated over time as we're moving to that red circle there and the right horizontal arrow. And it's it's integrated with intrinsic information as well. So long-term memories, conditional responses, strongly held beliefs. And, and so it integrates all this to form a rich context dynamic model of the unfolding situation to help guide our behavior. A paper by Petrie and colleagues uh, published in 2014 uh, presented a new method to analyze brain networks and applied that method to functional magnetic resonance imaging scans of individuals who received 
placebo on the left, as shown on the left here, or uh, psilocybin on the right. And, and what you're seeing are simplified cartoons of brain connectivity, um, where the width of the links is proportional to their weight and the size of the circle nodes there is proportional to their strength. And, and this is done to show the the, to highlight the, the striking difference in connectivity structure that we see here. And, and this difference supports the idea that psilocybin disrupts the normal organization of the brain with the emergence of these strong, long range functional connections that are not present in a normal state and only present in the psychedelic state. So therefore there is an increased integration or communication between different cortical regions of the brain and the psilocybin state, um, what we're seeing there. And so, so in other words, like the psychedelic state is associated with a less constrained and more intercommunicative mode of brain function. Okay, moving on. There is also a, um, a proposed entropic brain hypothesis popularized by Carhart Harris and colleagues. And this involves the idea that entropy or disorder or randomness is, is suppressed in normal waking consciousness, essentially by the default mode network. And they argue that this entropy suppression furnishes both normal waking consciousness with a constrained quality, and it furnishes associated metacognitive functions such as self uh, self awareness and and reality testing um, reducing uncertainty and so the 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 figure shows the spectrum of consciousness states in their model with the big black arrow in the in the middle representing where normal waking consciousness is and criticality proper they define as the borderline between uh, on the left, high entropy, high disorder, flexible states, and on the right, more more ordered, more um, rigid and kind of states. And on the right, they list some, some states like deep sleep, um, addiction, depression, OCD, and kind of associate that with these rigid states of thinking and uh, low entropy, low disorder states. And that's contrasted on the left with the psychedelic state or infant consciousness, like beginner's mind, um, REM sleep and dreaming, et cetera. Um, and so I'll start by explaining the figure. You can ignore um, the brain images for now, um, but, but participants uh, looking at the bar graph in the background, participants under psilocybin were much more likely to endorse an unconstrained characteristic to their thinking compared to placebo participants, as we can see with the bar graph, uh, psilocybin groups in blue, placebo in gray. Um, and so, so a more unconstrained style of, of thinking was endorsed, but looking at the brain images now um, with the acute administration of psilocybin, they noticed a decrease in cerebral blood flow um, and therefore highly organized activity in default mode network regions and some other regions. And that's highlighted in the left figure and also in the in the middle figure another assay to look at blood flow changes under the influence of psilocybin and they also noticed a um a connection uh, between like default mode network and medial temporal lobes that connection essentially does disintegrating under the influence of psilocybin and then the um Images on the right is showing that they noticed this decrease in synchronous uh, oscillatory activity, particularly in the alpha frequency band, which is eight to 13 Hertz. Um, and so interestingly, they therefore propose that the neural correlates of ego integrity, um, which dissolves to a certain degree under the influence of psilocybin is the network connectivity within the default mode network and that alpha frequency synchronous oscillatory activity predominantly in the PCC area of the DMN. Um, and, that, and that's what the ego integrity is. So, so they, they comment that you know, these findings are consistent with the hypothesis that the default mode network does play an integral role in creating the sense of self or the ego. So thus, you know, in summary, it's hypothesized that they hypothesize that there's this basic mechanism by which psychedelics can be helpful in psychiatry, 
whether it's to treat depression, OCD, or addiction. And they propose that the psychedelics work by dismantling the reinforced patterns of negative thought and behavior um, by breaking down those spatial, those, those stable spatiotemporal patterns of brain activity upon which they rest, so breaking down the default mode network essentially. So moving uh, forward to a paper published in 2020, expanding upon uh, the entropic brain hypothesis is this one titled Rebus, um, which stands for Relaxed Beliefs Under Psychedelics and the Anarchic Brain, uh, a working model. So they, they, the authors emphasize this idea that psilocybin decreases top-down suppression of latent memories, feelings, and desires, hence relaxed beliefs under psychedelics. And, um, and that allows for, for bottom-up signaling, like from the limbic system, to occur. So, so in the figure, if we look at the top left, we see an illustration um, documenting pre-psilocybin this in like a depressed or in individual with OCD, for example, with high default mode network activity, suppressing uh, lower level uh, input up into conscious awareness or, or more cerebral awareness. So, so there's a big arrow here kind of suppressing um, lower level information coming up, hence we see the small arrow. And that's illustrated on the top right with this rigid, uh, low entropy kind of ball dropping onto the hard surface there. And then um, on the bottom left corner, we note that the bottom up signaling and hence the term anarchic, that arrow has gotten larger um, and that bottom up signaling is allowed in the setting of psychedelics, um, which, which is illustrated in the bottom right figure by you know, a more entropic situation with more disorder um, and less rigidity. And so, um, Relating, you know, and then the author's comment, they, they relate psilocybin's activity to psychoanalytic theory and, and the claim supported by these authors is that psychedelics work to lower repression and facilitate access to the psychoanalytic unconscious. Um, and, and so another, you know, they also highlight that when the default mode network integrity breaks down, firmly held beliefs are perceived to be less certain. Um, and so information from the limbic system can be incorporated into forming a new model of reality, which allows for a change in patterns of behavior and beliefs. Um, and so kind of tying this all together and, and taking into account the post-acute state is this reset hypothesis given by Carhart, Harris and colleagues based out of the um, London. Um, and so the Again, the default mode network integrity, it, it acutely um, declines with psilocybin, but, but a day later, if you do fMRI brain scans a day later, they, they noted that default mode network integrity or activity was actually increased or perhaps normalized post-acutely, and those changes were accompanied by improvements in mood, hence this process likened to a reset mechanism of um, disintegrating the DMN and then letting it reintegrate in a healthier, more normal way. So I want to transition uh, to what administering psilocybin in a clinical setting looks like now. So, so first screening and then preparatory sessions occur before the day of psilocybin administration. Um, during these preparatory sessions, um, it's like a standard intake for psychotherapy session. Um, the participant may set an, set an intent for the psilocybin session. In the clinical trials, though, that I'm that I, um, going to talk about, the the expectation, like they're they're careful not to um, tell the participants too much of what to expect to not um, you know uh, influence their ratings too much. So it's probably done a little bit differently than it might be in real world settings if this were to get FDA approved in the future. Um, so I'll move into talking about the psilocybin session itself right now, as is illustrated by this photo from the Johns Hopkins Center for Psychedelic Research. Um, and this photo was, was taken from their website. And it's pretty typical. And what we see here is the 
um, participant is, is joined by two therapists or guides or monitors, usually one male, one female in all these studies. Um, they're, they're lying down in a couch or a recliner with pillows and blankets, wearing eye shades, listening to, there's, there's some headphones there, um, and they play generally classical music. Um, an important point here, though, is that the participants are generally directed to focus inward during their journey. So they're not asked to have a lot of back and forth conversation with the guides like you would see in a typical psychotherapy session or like you would see in a MDMA assisted psychotherapy session. So I won't go into too much detail, but as an interesting aside, the MDMA assisted psychotherapy is, is seems very different than the psilocybin assisted psychotherapy because those MDMA sessions, there's much talking back and forth and more prompting and a more active role of the therapist. If you're curious, I'd encourage you to go look at the MDMA training manual. Uh, it's about 70 pages. There's a link on the most recent phase three MDMA trial, but, but that's not what's happening here. However, there is a post psilocybin integration session or two or, or up to four after really each psilocybin session that's thought that it can lead to um, kind of consolidating the gains and helping the participants incorporate um, insights from the session into daily living. Okay. So there is a landmark uh, psilocybin study out of the Johns Hopkins Center for Psychedelic and Consciousness Research published in 2006 by Roland Griffiths and colleagues. Um, so 30 volunteers were, who had never tried psilocybin and who regularly participated in religious or spiritual activities received psilocybin or methylphenidate, and, and then they switched seven weeks later and got the other one. And the, the oral dose of psilocybin, 30 milligrams per 70 kilograms of body weight, that's a high dose of um, psilocybin. And what they, um, what the figures are showing on the left is systolic blood pressure and in the middle is diastolic blood pressure. And, and the top line has the circles representing the psilocybin group. Um, and so what we're seeing is psilocybin actually led to a, a greater increase in systolic and diastolic blood pressure compared to methylphenidate. It's transient, they, they normalized after the session. And then on the right, we can, it's just showing the timeline of the overall drug effects. So it kicks in within about an hour after administration, but the, the time to peak effect is roughly 180 minutes, three hours. And then six hours later, they're still having some effects there. It hasn't fully worn off. So here we can see volunteer ratings on three questionnaires completed seven hours hey, post. Hey, Nick. Sorry, yeah. Ryan. Yeah. I just want to let you know, you have excellent lectures generating some questions in the chat. I don't know if you wanted yeah. to handle those as they came up or just wait till the end? Oh, thanks for, thanks for letting me know, Dr. Shackelford. Oh, geez, I may just have to save these for the end in the interest of time. Um, and and if, if, if you or anyone else wants to pick up the most important ones, I'm happy to tackle those, but I'll, I'll try and get through and, and perhaps leave like uh, five minutes at the end. I don't know if I have the skills to to do both at the same time here. But I appreciate the comments though. Please keep them coming. Thanks everyone. Um, I will, I'll just continue and point out, I, I highlighted some interesting rating uh, questionnaires here and, and there were significant differences between the psilocybin and the methylphenidate group in all of them, except for a sensation of euphoria, but um, oceanic boundlessness and a sense of dread of ego dissolution or, I, I thought kind of interesting. Notice how there's more affect overall in the psilocybin group as well. Okay, so here on the left, we can see that over 60% of volunteers rated their psilocybin experience as one of the top five most personally meaningful experiences of their lifetime. Um, and by a show of hands here, who has heard patients tell you that taking Prozac was one of the most personally meaningful experiences of their lives? I'll give you guys a few seconds to. Show your hands, okay. Or zero out of 54 here, nice. Okay, so on the diagram on the right, we see that compared to the methylphenidate group, the psilocybin group at two months post-session had more positive attitudes about life, more positive mood changes, altruistic and positive social effects, positive behavior changes. 
and rated as as improving their sense of well-being and life satisfaction. And then with the same cohort of study uh, people, they they did a follow up, and and fourteen months later. Um, they showed that certain effects persisted even 14 months after their psilocybin session, including an increased uh, sense of well-being or life satisfaction. And so I um, wanted to highlight that, um, yeah, so, so, so that's a key point, that the sustained duration of action is what is one thing that separates psilocybin from like our traditional uh, antidepressants. Um, Moving on to uh, just a couple things, verbatim comments said by some of the uh, participants 14 months later, you can read them here. Um, one of them said, freedom from every conceivable thing, including time, space, relationship, self, etc. It was just the embodied me experienced ultimate transcendence, even of myself. And then another person talking about their psilocybin experience said that, the sense that all is one, that I experience the essence of the universe, and then knowing that God asks nothing of us except to receive love. These are not quotes I hear from people who take Lexapro for the first time. Okay, and then a similar study published in 2018, also, also by Griffiths and colleagues, um, was conducted and results were similar. You can see some of them there. Um, the authors conclude that psilocybin can occasion enduring trait level increases in pro-social attitudes and behaviors and healthy psychological fun functioning. Moving on, this uh, study published in 2016 by Ross and colleagues investigating psilocybin for treatment of cancer-related anxiety and depression um, was conducted. Will mentioned prior to this, the same group did a smaller feasibility study looking at the same thing. They used a smaller dose of psilocybin. The results weren't impressive at all. There weren't any side effect issues or safety issues. But in this study, um, they used a higher dose. So it was double-blinded, placebo-controlled. It's tough to have a placebo with psilocybin. In this case, they used niacin. And um, so in 29 pa patients with cancer-related anxiety or, and depression, and they got a single moderate dose of psilocybin. And so um, primary outcomes are shown in the figure there, uh, their depression severity scales and anxiety severity scales. And what we see um, is that the purple lines, the psilocybin group, the blue or the top lines, the placebo or niacin groups. And we see a significant uh, difference between the two groups. Um, the one that um, got niacin and the one that got psilocybin. And the effect sizes are about 1.0 Cohen's D. Um, and so at this same study, at six and a half months of follow-up, approximately 60 to 80% of participants continue to have clinically significant reductions in depression or anxiety. And over six months later, 87% reported increased life satisfaction or well-being attributed to the experience. Um, first bullet points shown by the figure there and um, in the middle is some secondary outcomes uh, that were notable there. Okay, uh, the first, oops, skipped a slide. Okay, the first modern trial of psilocybin uh, for treatment resistant major depressive disorder was published in 2016 by Carhart Harris and colleagues. It was a smaller trial um, and their definition of TRD is it's the typical one failing two meds or more in the past. Um, and so of the 12 participants, um, three had failed two meds, three had failed three meds and six had failed four or more uh, medication trials. So in the bottom left, we see the primary outcome measure, which is really, um, compared to baseline, which is the left bar depression scores and the quick inventory depression severity score. And we see large statistically significant reductions compared to baseline. On the right, uh, we see the same data there in a different format with the added um, data point of six months. So even at six months later, there was still a significant uh, decrease in depression score compared to baseline. And, and note that those numbers in red are the Cohen's D effect size, which is calculated a little differently than Hedges G and hence is slightly less. Okay, so um, another stu study was, was published in JAMA Psychiatry 
here looking at the psilocybin use and uh, major depressive disorder. So I've highlighted the name of a graduate of our psychiatry residency program here as a shout out to Dr. May. Um, but this, this study uh, was conducted with 27 patients who had MDD and they were randomized to immediate treatment versus delayed treatment uh, with psilocybin. They all underwent two sessions, first at a moderate dose, then at a high dose, and they all had supportive psychotherapy on average. And this included eight hours of preparatory sessions as well as two to three hours of integration sessions. And, um, and the study facilitators and guides and mentors, they were some were social workers, some were psychiatrists, some were psychologists, um, kind of all over the board, just highlighted a few characteristics. The average time they had been suffering from or had depression was 22 years. Mean time in current major depressive episode was 24 months. Two thirds were female. Um, and so here we have the results. So on the, on the left figure, we see the primary outcome measure comparing the two groups. Uh, the delayed treatment group is the darker circles and the orange square is the immediate treatment. And we see a, a rapid and, and sustained reduction in depression scores. So week five and week eight represent week one week and four weeks after the second psilocybin session. And notice we have a you know large Cohen D effect sizes of about 2.5, 2.6. And so in the overall treatment sample, 71% of participants showed greater than 50% reduction, aka a clinically significant response at four weeks of follow-up. And then on the right, we're we're seeing the two two groups combined there and still um, uh, large effect sizes over over a month after post-session two. Um, and so I, I just want to quickly mention that these effect sizes are looking at a change from baseline and therefore whatever placebo effect is at play here, the placebo effect is hidden within that effect size. So we would expect that the true effect size is smaller if you were to somehow be able to subtract out the placebo, although the patients may not care um, if it's placebo or drug effect. And then, so, so overall these studies, these findings in the study suggest that psilocybin with therapy is efficacious in treating major depressive disorder. And then I'm not showing this, but additionally, all of the secondary outcomes, um, which included other depression measures and other anxiety measures, demonstrated statistically significant uh, changes from baseline to four weeks uh, with large effect sizes after the psilocybin sessions. And then they also noted, uh, uh, which is kind of consistent with the most of the other studies I'll talk about, this association between more, more um, psilocybin occasion mystical type experiences uh, being associated with greater decreases in depression. Okay, I'm just gonna grab some water here. All right, this study was um, published I think just in September of last year, fairly fairly recently, um, Carhart, Harris, and colleagues uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine a study comparing psilocybin versus escitalopram for depression. This was a phase two double-blinded randomized controlled trial involving 59 adults with moderate to severe major depressive disorder um, randomized into two groups. The psilocybin group received two moderately high doses, so 25 milligram doses of psilocybin three weeks apart, and they took a daily placebo pill. And then the escitalopram group um, took escitalopram 10 milligrams daily for three weeks, then 20 milligrams daily for the other three weeks until the study finished, and they had placebo psilocybin sessions. In this study, the placebo, they just decided to use psilocybin one milligram, a, a really small dose, and as placebo. Um, and all the primary outcome measure was this uh, change in QIDS SR16 depressive symptom score at six weeks compared to compared to baseline. Um, I'll, I'll touch on the results in a minute here. Um, the, the patient demographics were similar to those in the JAMA uh, psychiatry study I just showed. And, and basically the preparatory psilocybin and integration sessions were conducted during the general protocol. Um, both, both groups got the same amount of psychological support as the authors put it and the authors comment that that may be augmenting the treatment of both groups. 
So here's the primary outcome measure, um, change in QIDS SR16 score uh, from baseline. It's shown in the figure. And we see the psilocybin group in the with the red line and the escitalopram group uh, represented by the blue line or the top line. And it the psilocybin group at, at times looks like it may be trending towards a statistically significant difference towards a lower uh, a greater decrease in depression than the acetallic pram group. But as we can see, these confidence levels overlap um, at the six week endpoint. So they concluded there, there's no statistically significant difference seen between the two groups in the primary outcome measure. Um, the secondary outcomes, however, are a different story as we can see here. So um, every secondary outcome besides one actually showed a difference between the two groups generally favoring psilocybin. Some of those secondary outcomes that, that were significant included remission at six weeks, according to the QIDS SR16. Also, um, changes from baseline at six weeks, according to the Hamilton depression rating scale and the Montgomery and Asperg depression rating scale. So other uh, secondary outcomes that favored psilocybin over escitalopram include what we see in the left figure, the uh, WEN, WBS, the Warwick Edinburgh mental well-being scale. Also, we can see on here, there's some abbreviations, but FS is a flourishing scale. There's a Spielberg Strait anxiety inventory, a brief experiential avoidance questionnaire, et cetera. And these generally favored um, psilocybin over escitalopram. Um, I, I want to talk about tolerability and, and, and comment that the, the incidence of adverse events was similar in the trial groups and no serious ad adverse events occurred. But the percentage of patients who had anxiety, dry mouth, sexual dysfunction, or redu reduced emotional responsiveness was higher in the escitalopram group. And no patient in the psilocybin group requested to cancel the second psilocybin session or reduce the dose, but four patients in the escitalopram group stop taking their daily uh, medication due to perceived side effects and one person cut it in half. Um, and so, so overall, what this study suggests is that psilocybin is an effective treatment for major depressive disorder and is not inferior to the current standard of care. Um, secondary outcomes generally favor psilocybin and are somewhat uh, and are similar to what has been reported in prior studies. And the escitalopram group did show higher rates of discontinuation in the setting of non-transient side effects. Okay, moving ahead, um, Compass Pathways is a for-profit organization, and they have started the largest clinical trial of psilocybin for the treatment of treatment-resistant major depressive disorder. And so the study is not yet published, but preliminary results are posted on their website, which is where I got this data. Um, and the study included 233 individuals. They all had treatment resistant depression who were randomized into three groups, a one milligram psilocybin group, a 10 milligram, and a 25 milligram psilocybin group. So participants had only one psilocybin session, and they all had psychological support, weren't many details provided other than that as to the psychotherapy piece of it. Um, so this figure shows the primary outcome measure, um, which is a change from baseline and Madras total score at three weeks post psilocybin session. So the gray line represents the one milligram group, the uh, green line represents the 10 milligram group and the blue line represents the 25 milligram group. And we see a statistically significant reduction in depression score in the 25 milligram group compared to the one milligram group immediately. So day two through week six. Um, a key uh, second, key secondary endpoint is illustrated by the figure here, um, which is illustrating Montgomery Asperg depression rating scale response, which is defined as a greater than 50% decrease in Madras total score from baseline. And so we can see roughly a 37% response at three weeks and a 33% response at 12 weeks within the 25 milligram group. And here we look at the remission rates, um, which is defined as a Madras score less than 10. And notice that approximately 29 and 
of the HIDAS group achieved remission from their treatment resistant depression um, three and 12 weeks respectively after a single dose of uh, psilocybin. And so this study provides further evidence that psilocybin has some efficacy for treatment resistant depression. And so per their website, they, they expect to meet with the FDA Q1 of 2022 to discuss uh, results of this trial and to work with the FDA on developing um, the protocol for a larger phase three clinical trial, which they haven't yet started. And so that kind of, that brings me to my next point of breakthrough therapy designation. Um, so breakthrough therapy designation, it's a process designed to expedite the development and review of drugs that are intended to treat a serious condition. And I've highlighted preliminary clinical evidence indicates that the drug may demonstrate substantial improvement over available therapy on a clinically significant endpoint. So Compass Pathways originally received a breakthrough therapy designation from the FDA for psilocybin in the treatment of treatment resistant depression. And later in 2019, the USONA Institute, which is a not-for-profit organization received breakthrough therapy designation from the FDA uh, for psilocybin and the treatment of major depressive disorder. So having an FDA breakthrough therapy designation is a strong sign that the FDA will be approving psilocybin once phase three trials are completed, assuming that existing results are similar to results in future studies and there aren't any new safety concerns that arise. Um, all right, um, I, I'm gonna go quickly through these uh, last smaller study slides here, uh, just because I notice a number of comments in the, in the chat and wanna save a little time at the end for discussion and to hear other people's thoughts uh, about this topic. So, you know, there, there's some substance use disorder studies. This is one looking at tobacco addiction published at a Johns Hopkins group in 2014. And, and these were heavy smokers, but you know, no control group here, but essentially heavy smokers, mean of 19 cigarettes a day, 31 years of smoking at intake, had two to three psilocybin sessions as this adjunct to tobacco smoking cessation. And 12 of the 15 participants showed seven day point prevalence abstinence at six months of follow-up. So the left figure is showing the overall um, treatment group, all 15 of them. The right figure is actually showing the three people that did not have seven day point prevalence abstinence at six months of follow up. So even those who, who, um, who were still smoking, were smoking fewer. Uh, again, small study, you gotta take it with a little bit of grain of salt. Um, same thing with the psilocybin free alcohol dependent study. You know, it's 10 volunteers. Um, they received psilocybin in one or two supervised sessions in combo with motivational enhancement therapy. And, and there's no control group here, but in the overall cohort, they, cohort, they noted a decrease in percent drinking days and percent heavy drinking days. Psilocybin has also been studied for OCD. So this is this was actually one of the earlier studies published in 2006, but very small group, um, nine subjects with OCD and no other current major psychiatric disorder. We know how common that is. Um, they, they had various doses of psilocybin sessions, um, up to four, and use the Yale Brown obsessive compulsive scale to assess for symptom reduction. And they noticed this immediate, these are hours on the um, X axis here, immediate reduction in obsessive compulsive symptom severity. Um, so, okay, so can psilocybin use lead to personality change? Uh, these studies would suggest the answer is yes. So in one study um, of participants, those who had mystical experiences um, during their psilocybin session, they, they went back and, and the trait, the personality trait of openness remained significantly higher than baseline more than a year after the session. Another study showed that the personality trait of neuroticism significantly decreased and extroversion and openness significantly increased. And then looking at, you know, approximately 30 personality traits, 10 or 11 of them showed some significant change between pre-psilocybin and post-psilocybin. Um, so it will be interesting to see if psilocybin ever becomes a common treatment of personality disorders. 
I would be remiss if I didn't talk about risks more. So, so risks of use, uh, especially in non-controlled, non-medical settings, um, include panic reactions leading to dangerous behavior. So there are case reports of people who were not suicidal, taking psilocybin and having a suicide attempt, or who previously were nonviolent, attacking police officers or engaging in reckless or violent behavior. Um, so I, I can't stress enough that the risks of psilocybin appear to be greatly reduced by administering psilocybin in a medically controlled setting. Um, the safety of psilocybin in recreational settings appears to be much less than in medical settings. And, and it's an entirely different question in part because set and setting are so important. Um, other risks are, are like acute side effects, um, common physiologic responses, including the transient tachycardia and hypertension, headaches are common, nausea, vomiting common, diaphoresis, paranoia, fear, crying, they're all common. They generally reside the, the day of the treatment. Um, a bad trip or a challenging experience, um, those are common too. and. A, a small percent of people do report negative influences of well-being um, due to a bad trip. However, this uh, survey um, looking at recreational users, asking them about their most uh, challenging and like their their worst trip, their bad trip, essentially, um, asked them about it. And despite all the difficulties, 84% of those people said it was still, um, they still benefited from the experience, even though it was terrifying. Um, I asked, what about serotonin syndrome? Um, the partial agonism nature of psilocin makes the risk of serotonin syndrome um, unlikely. And so it's actually what the, everyone in these studies is off of SSRI, and that's really to, because SSRIs will lead to a, um, a blunted effect or reduced e efficacy of psilocybin. It just won't do, do as much if they're taking an SSRI. So I also have on the um, list here of possible risks, HPPD, hallucinogen persisting perception disorder. This is a DSM-5 diagnosis and there are case reports of worsening mental functioning, including enduring psychotic symptoms that came on about the same time as the psilocybin use, uh, lasting greater than a year. Um, not in any of the medic uh, of the controlled trials, but in recreational users. Um, also, I have mentioned here uh, seizures. Um, so this this paper, uh, this fellow from Johns Hopkins, Nyack, uh, published in 2021. Um, he looked at real world users of psilocybin and their reported adverse events in non-scientific websites such as reddit or shroomery.org and and what he found is that 47 percent of individuals taking lithium who use psilocybin had at least one seizure um, they also had a much higher proportion of uh, bad trips um, and so physiologic dependence is not possible but psychological dependence can occur Okay, as we're coming towards closer to the end here, um, I just want to highlight some of the pros and cons of psilocybin. Key pros are that there's these studies show a rapid reduction in depression and anxiety, um, which is an advantage over other treatments, um, and also sustained symptom reduction, six to maybe even 14 months or longer. <laughs> Uh, which is unique. There's no daily pill. Most side effects are transient uh, the day of, and it often improves the sense of well-being and other like positive pro-social attitudes and behaviors that we don't really think about when we're just thinking about treating depression, for example. Some of the cons of psilocybin, though, in include that it it's a full day. It's an eight plus hour session or 11 hours even. And so it's you, you need the staffing for that. Um, the, it can be a really challenging or uncomfortable experience as traumatic memories are coming up. Difficult feelings that they've been avoiding for a long time might be coming up. Maybe some, some grief that's been put off. It, it can be a really challenging experience. It's not a fun experience. Um, and then how do we implement this into the real world if, if it's an eight plus hour session? What's that going to cost? Other cons is that the in order to get the full effect, you need to taper off antidepressants first, which is risky in and of itself. And it's not yet FDA approved. So I, I put this little um, 
chart together, kind of comparing psilocybin to other um, compounds of interest in research space and in the media. So MDMA, ketamine, and comparing that to SSRIs. And so looking at some of the traits, psilocybin, MDMA, and ketamine, they all have this rapid onset of action, which is very uh, in contrast to the SSRIs. So huge advantage there uh, to psilocybin. The during duration of benefits I've talked about, it, MDMA and psilocybin, it seems to be really sustained six plus months. Um, ketamine though, it, it's kind of in the middle. It's like days to weeks. It definitely wears off faster. And that's a one of the downsides of ketamine compared to psilocybin for depression, it's what it seems to be. And then, you know, the SSRIs generally stop working once you stop taking them. Effect sizes are listed here. I, I Most of the effect sizes are large with psilocybin, but in that psilocybin versus escitalopram group, it was uh, closer to moderate. So I put probably large here. Um, and, and it is large with PTSD and ketamine, at least initially. So um, compare that to the low to moderate effect size. Um, it's interesting that the standard of care is the least effective treatment. Um, the side effects, like I talked about, are generally transient with all three of these compounds compared to SSRIs. The cost, I, I think this is one uh, area where the SSRIs hands down win easily. Um, it's just way, way cheaper. Um, they're cheap generic medications. And you're not paying for this, this therapist cost, uh, which I think will be a lot of the cost of psilocybin and MDMA is like having someone sit there with the patient for eight hours. That's one advantage of ketamine over psilocybin though, is that the ketamine session only lasts about two hours. So in theory, you could see four patients in a day instead of like one, for example. Um, okay, this is yeah, this is my last slide before the references here. So I'll leave some time for questions. But um, currently, you know, where, where is all this going? So if you look on clinicaltrials.gov and type in psilocybin, you you see that there's over 70 or, or there were 70 when I looked uh, a little bit ago, um, registered clinical trials with psilocybin as an intervention, um, including a University of Washington conducted study uh, giving psilocybin to healthcare workers to assess its impact on burnout. Um, but other studies are looking at anorexia, nervosa, many substance use disorders, OCD, body dysmorphic disorder, um, chronic pain and fibromyalgia, et cetera. And, and so it's being studied more and more with this growing body of evidence and the FDA breakthrough therapy designation, I'm predicting it will be approved, FDA approved for depression in around 2025, hard to say exactly, but it seems to be on track to get FDA approval. Um, and, and once it is, I, I think successful implementation into clinical practice will be challenging given the stark contrast of the psilocybin assisted therapy session to the traditional medical treatment model of 30 minute uh, follow up medication management appointments. Um, you know, many thousands of individuals suffering from depression could benefit. Um, that's the most important thing to me in my mind. Those experiencing other conditions may benefit as well as it's being investigated for other interventions, um, given the kind of the transdiagnostic efficacy we're starting to see in these early studies. Um, more research is needed to determine if there's any significant lowering of suicide risk with psilocybin. Um, I'd be interested to find